Well, not many comics to talk about this week, and I've got some mild concerns about a couple of them, but I'm still uh, pretty interested. <laughs> we'll see if I stick with them all. I'm Peter Franson from ChristianGeekCentral.com and Spirit Blade Productions. Welcome to Essential Issues Weekly, where I talk about DC Comics one week after their release on the ultra tier of the DC Universe Infinite subscription service. In each installment, I pick an assortment of comics to talk about as a DC fan and also explore what, if anything, they have to say about the essential issues of real life. Now, warning full spoilers for everything that I talk about. This is your first and only warning. Many spoilers ahead. Right now we're going to take a look at comics originally released to the Ultra Tier on April 30th, originally published April 2nd. First among those is uh, Birds of Prey number 8. Uh, I don't... man. I think I'm going to be skimming this one going forward until either the creative team changes... well, I don't know. This continues the story from last time where the Birds of Prey have to go undercover as runway models wearing lingerie. And they took it a step further, and Barda ends up... I don't even know why it happened or how it happened, but she ends up completely naked, and they do a little cheeky kind of logo of Barda that's covering, you know, her uh, private parts. And I'm just like, why why in the world are we doing this, you know? Um, so anyway, I talked about that some last time. I talked about Birds of Prey number seven, so I don't need to get into that again. But all that to say... Okay, this by the end of this story, they're out of the lingerie, they're back into their costumes. Was that just a one-off thing to kind of get readers engaged based on their worst qualities? <laughs> um, if so, then I'll just shrug and be willing to move past it for now. But if these kinds of trends continue, I don't know. So I think I'm going to be skimming Birds of Prey, maybe just seeing if the writer changes, just kind of see, keep an eye out for any significant changes that might make me think that I have hope for enjoying this title. But right now, even though they've made a, an art, a, a, a tweak to the creative team, um, I'm not happy with uh, how this team is starting out. Uh, moving on to Shazam number 10. Um, gosh, this one, in one sense, I'm like... I'm done. Um, in another sense, I'm like still curious. Mark Wade, at least with this arc that started with uh, issue 10, Moving Day, part one, doesn't seem to be writing this. Instead, um, I didn't catch, it says on the cover, Campbell is the last name. I can't remember the, the first name, but anyway. Um, so that has my attention, but yet the cover still has plenty of like a talking dinosaur with <laughs> with a monocle and a top hat and just like I really do not like those elements I get why they might lean into them it is something pretty unique to uh Captain Marvel as I will always think of him and yet I'm not sure if it's a great selling point they'll the, the number crunches at DC would be able to tell you that um but in any case yeah there, there's just no real stakes in this story. At first, it seems like there's going to be. In the opening pages, you've got one of the characters kind of sadly monologuing about what a hard thing moving day is for foster kids. But then that really gets wiped away and says, and basically the idea is, but this is the exact opposite of that. It's a great and happy moving day. And from there, the stakes just uh, increasingly vanish. There is kind of an interesting status quo change in that their rebuilt house that they're living in has portals to the dwellings of the Greek gods, which I think might introduce some kind of ongoing device that the writers could use to maybe do some interesting things. But again, it still seems so trivial and lighthearted and weightless that I doubt it's going to be interesting to me, whatever they choose to do with the Greek gods. However, it really does kind of get potentially grounded uh, later on in the story when their foster parents announce to all the kids living in this foster home that they say there's still a lot of paperwork and CPS will have to do interviews, but with your permission, we're starting the process to adopt all of you. And I think this is meant to be like really happy news, really good news, and certainly it's heartwarming and really cool to see. I wonder long term if this will be something that they regret because then it'll take all these kids out of the foster home or orphan type of situation and, you know, have them settled into like a real stable, solid family. Now, I like that. I think there needs to be a lot more of like stable, loving families in entertainment and in comic books. Um, but when the status quo, when the concept for so long has been uh, orphans, foster kids. I wonder if that, if it'll lose something um, by going that route. Either way, I hope that 
as they explore this process with adoption, that the, the lighthearted nature of the comic will be permitted to go to some heavier places because while I have not, you know, we've never adopted or fostered, uh, we know several people in our church family that have gone through this process and have shared some of what they've gone through. And there, there are just often some really hard things that people have to deal with while trying to adopt kids. A lot of it has to do with difficult court days and situations with the biological parents that are really dicey and difficult and hard choices that have to be made to really figure out what is best for the child involved. And here we're talking about a situation where it's a, it's a, a family full of kids that are each you know, statistically going to have their own very different particular situation that's going to need to be dealt with. And so I'm wondering if this book will be permitted by editorial and if there will be an interest on the part of the writer or writers to really lean into the hard realities of uh, the adoption system in America. And I think it could really create opportunity for some powerful drama. I just don't think that this book so far has indicated that it's interested in powerful drama at all. So <laughs> I don't know if this is just going to be like glossed over and like, hey, you know, here's bumps here and there. Uh oh, but hey, it all worked out in six issues. We're done. Where instead, I think you could set up a new status quo where the the new status quo for a while is the struggles of making this all happen for each and every one of these kids to bring them finally permanently into this family. I mean, so much potential there, but I got a feeling it's gonna be uh, it's gonna be pretty wasted. But we'll see. I think Shazam at this point with this status quo change has me curious enough to at least continue skimming, as admittedly I did a lot of while reading Shazam number ten. Certainly the comic that had my attention the most this week was Batman 146, which for about a third of it at least, provides some much needed recap on all the crazy stuff that's been going on with Zuranar and the Joker. But even in the end, there was still stuff I was like, man, I forgot that Vandal Savage is a moving piece, that the character Punchline is a moving piece. There have been so many in Chip Zdarsky's run as writer, so many moving pieces going on um, that like, oh my gosh. Um, I, 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 this recap was so needed, even for me, who's been reading every one of these issues since I think the beginning of Zadarsky's run, if I remember correctly. So I, I'm definitely interested. I'm invested. I want to see where things go, but I am concerned that <laughs> that this big recap here um, is a symptom of the just like the crazy complexity of all the moving parts that are going on. I have my doubts that this is really going to be able to focus in and lock in on a story arc and the completion of that arc in a way that will come away from and say, wow, that run was really cool in the way that we would say that of um, some other writers in the past who have handled uh, a Batman book like this and done some really interesting things over a long period of time. So far, I'm not feeling the same enjoyment of that singular vision of a writer like I did in previous runs uh, of Batman books. Now, if you've been uh, getting my thoughts on this book up to this point, you know that I've got my eye on this concept of um, the Batman of Zurinar having uploaded, quote unquote, his consciousness or memory or, I, or whatever into this Amazo-based android called Failsafe. So Zurinar is now inhabiting Failsafe, and I'm not even sure what they call him anymore. I think they don't call him Failsafe anymore. I think they Failsafe is the body, Zurinar is the character. But Zurinar is basically trying to convince Batman's supporting cast, his adopted family in many cases, that he is Bruce Wayne, because Bruce Wayne has been taken off-grid, is kind of tucked away uh, by Zurinar in cooperation with the warden of, of a, was it Blackade or Arkham? I can't remember which one. And he's in there with the Joker. There's stuff going on. Lot, lots of moving pieces, like I said. Uh, but anyway, the supporting cast has been presenting the question to themselves and to each other, is this really Batman? And what I said last time is that, well, um, that doesn't work. Even on a naturalistic world, I mean, first of all, if you have a dualistic worldview where there is physical and spiritual components that are necessary to make a complete human being, then you can't just transfer someone digitally just by recording their memories or whatever is encoded onto their brain 
copying that data into a new body, you better have some process figured out whereby the incorporeal, the, the non-material part, the spirit, moves over to this new body if you believe that like a complete human has to have both of those components. So on a dualistic worldview, on a theistic, uh, well, maybe not necessarily some forms of theism, but on the Christian worldview, uh, you can't do this. It's, it's not going to be that person because they're not complete. Even on a naturalistic, atheistic worldview, it is not the same person. It is a copy. Uh, it is, even if it's a perfect copy, it is only a copy uh, of the original. Um, even if you destroy the original so that you don't have to think about the original anymore, what remains is still not that original. It is a separate entity in, in, a, se in, in a separate body. It's a different thing. Um, so I've been wondering how are these characters going to be puzzling through this? On what basis will they believe or disbelieve that Zurinar is Bruce? Um, it looks like, ultimately, they're not going to disbelieve that it's Bruce on the basis of any kind of particular worldview. <laughs> um, they're certainly allowing for it. Like, what I see on this page here is that uh, Dick says to Barbara, he's been struggling with his backup personality, Zurinar, so we're at least certain that's influenced his decision to inhabit this fail-safe body. And Barbara says... Uh, you know, we don't know if it's actually him or not, there's a very high chance that Bruce is in there. So at least that says to me one of several things, that Barbara is a naturalist, um, that the writer is a naturalist, or that Barbara and or the writer just haven't given this much thought, you know, which I think the third part is is more likely, and I th or maybe the, the fourth scenario is they've given it the th thought, there's complete awareness of the worldview ramifications here, and they're just kind of glossing over that because they figure writers aren't going to care. Um, and most writers probably won't, but this dork does. <laughs> this is the kind of stuff that I tend to lock in on. Um, so uh, it looks like, based on what Barbara has said here, um, that ultimately what's what's going to tip them off to the fact that this is not Bruce is that there'll be some inconsistencies in Zurinar's personality compared to Bruce's personality. But it still would be very, very cool for me personally if they would bring in some of these worldview ramifications and allow that to be part of their wrestling because it is such a major component, something that, uh, that we ought to encourage other people to think about who are maybe nonchalantly, not in a serious way, but still suggesting that one day humans may gain immortality by uploading our consciousness into other bodies and stuff because uh, that is just a, a false hope even as an armchair philosopher for immortality. So anyway, I guess uh, those are probably uh, all the things that I have to say about these three comics. My ring choice for this week um, is the Sinestro Core, the Yellow Lantern Core uh, ring representing fear. There, there just aren't the right emotional uh, spectrum rings for what I really feel. I don't have any fear. I have no fears. <laughs> I have very mild, maybe, I don't know, concerns. Like, yeah, I don't know. I've got my doubts. I've got my skepticism. I feel like the closest thing that I can come to on that this week would be fear. So um, I have my doubts or quote unquote concerns that Birds of Prey is going in a direction that I'm going to like, that Shazam is going in a direction that I'm going to like, and that Batman is going to go in a philosophically satisfying direction. Um, yeah, we'll see. But to some degree, and especially with Batman, I'm still curious a bit about all these books. Definitely interested to see where Batman's going to go. Um, but I guess those are all of my thoughts on comic books for now. As always, I would love to get your thoughts in the comments below about these books or something else that I didn't talk about this week. Uh, and also, please remember to check out ChristianGeekCentral.com. Tons more content going on there for you. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye. For more chat about geek entertainment, answers to your questions, and news from the wider world of Christian geekery, get the Christian Geek Central podcast today on iTunes and other podcast services.